Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And what a pleasure it is for us to be here, and we're delighted that you have joined us. Thank you. We're surrounded by the spectacular artwork of Robert Irwin, Richard Serra, and Julie Moretu, and that's an amazing treat for us, I think. Um, my name is Peter Barron. I'm the development manager for the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music, and I've also um, I've done some work with the international team in recent years, so I've been fortunate to meet a few of you with that hat on, and I have both those hats on tonight. I'm also subbing in somewhat in this uh, MC role for my colleague, James, who sends his apologies. He's been called away to a, to a, family, um, a family situation, so we're wishing him well. So, uh, so the actor in me is quite excited about my call to the stage as the understudy. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I resisted bringing headshots to hand around, by the way, also. <laughs> There's enough of you here from this industry, but we'll, we'll talk later. That's fine. Um, I'd like to begin now by acknowledging also the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered tonight, the land of the Tongva and Chumash, I hope I've said that right, peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and future, which is something we do respectfully in Melbourne always as well, and, um, and rightfully so. I've got a few thank yous and welcomes to make. Um, first, I'd like to thank our panellists tonight for joining us this evening. We have a wonderful mix of guests from Los Angeles and Melbourne to explore the theme of creative enterprise. From, in from here in Los Angeles, we have University of Melbourne alumni Alison Bell and Rob Bell, and they tell us they're not related, and we take their word on that. <laughs> <laughs> and from Melbourne, we have Sandra Scuberis, Head of Film and TV at the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music in the VCA, and, uh, and I will join them later to, uh, to work through our discussion. Uh, we also have Eleanor Holmes here from the Australian Consulate General, Los Angeles office. Thank you for joining us. And also Julia Jerving from our University of Melbourne uh, West Coast office, which is based in San Francisco. But most importantly, I'd like to welcome you, our Melbourne alumni, here in Los Angeles. You are part of a global alumni community of more than 420,000 graduates. And there are more than 7,000 Melbourne, Melbourne alumni in the US, with more than 1,000 based here in California alone, which might surprise you. It's quite a big number. And we hope that you all take advantage of that considerable network in this city. And thank you for being here and, and braving virus challenges and the, un and the great unknown, <laughs> and we appreciate that risk. Um, I know that some of you also support our students as donors or as mentors through our Ask Alumni online program, and we say a heartfelt, sincere thank you for that. For our students, having access to a Melbourne education is an incredible, ac inc an incredible asset, and the insights and life experience of Melbourne alumni community can make a huge difference, so thank you sincerely for that. So before we get to the main event, um, a couple of quick updates from our campus in Melbourne, for those of you who've not been back lately. The university continues to grow and thrive with more than 54,000 students from 150 countries. More than 40% of our students are from overseas and 10% from interstate, which means that Melbourne has truly become a global and national university. This makes sense given that the university has been ranked number one in Australia for the past eight years and ranked number 32 in the world by the Times higher education rankings last year. And while rankings are far from perfect and we take them with a, with a big grain of salt, they, they do help us attract some truly fantastic students and academics and we're still quite happy to own them when, we, when, they, when we're so well favoured by them. So um, we'll continue to tell them about them while it's a good story. Um, this growth means that, that we need better ways to help all these students get to and from university. So that at the moment there is a massive trench uh, dug under or dug along and under Grattan Street. I don't know if you remember that in the middle of the campus, because the city of Melbourne is putting in an underground train station, a metro, right in the middle of the Parkville campus, which is pretty amazing. Uh, this is part of the city's 11 billion dollar metro rail project, and we're thrilled to be getting a train station at Parkville finally, and uh, that will connect our campus to the rail network for the first time in a couple of years' time. We've got to get through the mess first. But the changes aren't happening just at Parkville. We've seen $200 million invested at the university's Southbank campus, long time home to the VCA, and now also home to the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. It has undergone a truly extraordinary transformation. The Buxton Contemporary Gallery, which was opened a few years ago, was also built at Southbank as a brand new gallery and educational facility focused on contemporary Australian art. And the old horse, the Victorian police stables, have been transformed into amazing art studios and a new performance space, the Martin Meyer Arena. And more recently, we celebrated the opening of the new Conservatorium of Music, a truly remarkable facility for the next generation of brilliant musicians 
who are now at South, South Bank with their colleagues from the VCA. And, it, and if you haven't been back, or when you do come back to Melbourne and visit, I, I encourage you to, to contact us, to me and, and our colleagues, and come and have a look and have a walk around. It, it really is world class now, and we're really proud of owning that. Uh, it's an incredible precinct, and the university's right in the, the middle of it, literally. So this museum has bec been a world class venue in large part due to local government support and the power of philanthropy. It is a model which compares similarly to our own precincts with the Melbourne Arts Precinct, having been constructed on the back of state government support and a dedicated philanthropic network. Our commitment to public engagement at Melbourne means that we are drawing wider audiences to the wonders of the Melbourne Arts Precinct. It means utilising diverse and important cultural collections that are not dissimilar in size and range to those held by LACMA and making them more available to students as research and inspiration to the wider public. So I thought I'd give you a little update on the coronavirus at the moment and its impact on our students. Um, it's deeply topical. Um, so the university is, is, of course, deeply concerned for our community who face uncertainty due to the coronavirus, COVID-19, and associated travel restrictions. We've been in contact with every affected student, making more than 11,000 phone calls, and continue to provide support and care for everyone in our community who may be affected. Students who have been affected are eligible for support grants, these are intended to help with unanticipated expenses incurred as a result of the travel restrictions and to help students transition to or return to study at the university. We're also providing a range of wellbeing and course planning support measures, including flexible start dates, digital resources and catch-up arrangements, as we must. On Monday, the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, a joint venture between the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital, was awarded $2.5 million by the Jack Ma Foundation to expedite the creation of a vaccine against COVID-19. Scientists from the Doherty were the first to grow COVID-19 in a lab outside of China and the first to share it with public health laboratories nationally and globally at the end of January. So like other institutes, research institutes in Australia and elsewhere, these scientists have been front and centre advising government on how to respond. And when a problem like this hits the world, you want, to, you want the top scientific experts working together on the job, talking to governments and to each other and driving knowledge forward. So we're very proud that, that the University of Melbourne family, as we are here tonight, can take pride in that impressive work by a small part of our academic community. It, it, it's pretty significant. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the rest rooms you may have found are located back across the little pathway as you enter into the other gallery building and the, and the staff will, will support you there as you need it, direct you there. Um, after our panel conversation, there'll be light refreshments, so please stick around for us and enjoy that networking opportunity. So now tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Sandra Scabera, Senior Lecturer and Head of VCA Film and Television, Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. And having established... Sandra? Yeah, thank you. So Sandra's established long relationships with the industry and she's known to plenty of you here as a professional screenwriter and director. She also works through her film company, Three Feet of Film, in development and production, and she's here to share some interesting things with you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Welcome, everybody. So excited, I don't need my glasses. It's like, <laughs> yes. Okay, um, welcome. I'm really excited to be here in LA, where industries of so many of our alumni collide in a great way. It really demonstrates just how connected we all are if we just knew where each other were. Um, the university is always looking for ways to support our alumni and I'm pleased to announce a new initiative that will give, a vital, that will give vital assistance to our alumni in LA. Thanks to a new partnership between Australians in Film and the University of Melbourne, our film and television alumni will have the opportunity to walk at the f work at the former home of Charlie Chaplin here in Los Angeles the three-year partnership will allow mid-year career film and television alumni to apply for a hot desk at Charlie's, an exclusive Australian creative embassy located in the heart of fabulous Hollywood on the lot of the historic Raleigh, St uh, Raleigh Studios. We had a look at it today, fantastic space. The first alumni to secure a hot desk at Charlie's will be Nick Watson, who's here this evening, a comedy and animation writer who has written for Final Space and um, is currently developing the animated children's show Log as a co-production between Pirate Size Productions and Starburns Industries with funding from Screen Australia. We're really proud that he's going to take the first um, period of time there, Nick. 
thank you to Peter Ritchie, Executive Director of AIF, who's here tonight. Um, the partnership will give alumni an essential foothold in LA, which I'm outrageously excited about. Okay, um, now on to the Screen Fund. Um, I'm also really pleased to let you know of a new ambitious philanthropic project we're developing called the Melbourne Screen Fund. There's enormous financial pressure on students to complete their graduation films to the standard that industry expect. Each student nowadays needs to raise considerable funds and they don't always have the financial support that they need. It's a, it's a big difference from how film schools were structured 20 years ago when I got, went to the fam, same film school and got $8,000. That just does not exist anymore today. So it is a struggle, and it's particularly a struggle when you want to put um, important elements like diversity and equity at the forefront of what I think is a, is a, is should be a modern day um, filmmaking school. So I think we really need to address that. And um, so therefore, uh, we see this as an opportunity, the Screen Fund to also support alumni from across the university to create original works for Screen, who need top up, gap financing, or the development funding. We want to support our graduates and see great new Australian work created. Don't worry, we're not asking you to get your wallets out tonight. But for many alumni here, we hope this, along with Charlie's, is something you'll engage with in the future years. This short promotional video, <laughs> <laughs> and you know exactly why I'm laughing in a moment, for the fund showcases some of the work of last year's graduates. Uh, Peter, that's your cue. I was hinting. Hello, I'm Sandra Skaberas, Head of Film and Television at the Victorian College of the Arts, University of Melbourne, and I'm really pleased to invite you to support the Melbourne Screen Fund. We believe in the power of cinema to entertain, to inform and inspire. We encourage the kind of risk-taking that allows for stories of all kinds to be told. We now have an ambitious goal to build a philanthropic fund to support student filmmakers in their final year when they really need it, especially those struggling financially. We also see an opportunity to support alumni with original productions looking for small grants for top-up or development funding to take the next step in their career development. Please join us in supporting the Melbourne Screen Fund. With your help, filmmaking talent will flourish. <laughs> okay, and now to the main part of the evening, I'd like to introduce our panel, which include myself, uh, Alison Bell, who uh, is the co-creator co-writer and producer and star of The Letdown, an, a an, a an ABC Netflix international co-production and the first Australian comedy commissioned by Netflix International. Prior to The Letdown, Alison, a multi-award winning theatre actress, was perhaps best known for her work on the MTC, Belvoir, STC, Malthouse and STC, <laughs> yes, they, which just sounds like, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> My brain went elsewhere then. <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous theatre. She is currently developing a new show with FX in the US and in Australia, amongst other projects, a mini series with Revolver and her first play for Malthouse Theatre. Welcome. Okay. Rob Bell is Executive Vice President, International New Media for NBC Universal. Rob oversees licensing of Universal Films and TV series to global digital platforms and leads digital strategy for NBC Universal in Europe, Latin America and the Asia Pacific. Since joining NBC 
Universal in 2006, Rob has been pivotal in driving the growth of the company's digital business and prior to this was Senior Director at Sony Music in London, overseeing European digital business. And finally, we're delighted to have Peter Barron <laughs> as our moderator dash actor for this evening. <laughs> Peter is currently Development Manager for the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music, home to the VCA, and in recent months has represented the university international team with its work here in the US. He is also a trained actor through um, WA WAPA, uh, Academy of Performing Arts, who still works professionally and will no doubt be wanting to impress any studio people here this <laughs> evening. <laughs> I wrote that joke. I yeah. wrote that joke. I confess. Uh, enough, uh, enough of that joke. Enough and of those jokes. I just on a personal note from uh, film and television and our faculty, um, without uh, Peter in his position working alongside me, I don't think we would have been able to instigate many of these things tonight. So, you know, team and power to everybody in external <laughs> relations and up above universities. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay so... Um, our topic is creative enterprise on the global stage. It's intentionally quite, quite broad, although we have a definite film and television feel to our panel. So I suspect mm -hmm. that will be our common reference point, which is appropriate, we're in LA. We thought if we come to LA, what a beautiful place, what an appropriate place to talk about the meaning of creativity and enterprise. This is a city where that definitely happens and that's what we'd like to, like to discuss. Um, there's, a, there's an audience full of people that could have sat on this panel with us, mm. I think, you know. Um, so feel free if you're feeling involved to put your hand up and ask a question or contribute, we'd, we'd welcome that. And, and in a big loud voice for our, we have a streaming audience back to Melbourne, by the way, live. Um, so if you do want to, please do contribute. Um, and, and away we go. Um, I, I'm using this as my backdrop, you can see that, I'm just letting you know, um, <laughs> reminding you of the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the opportunities. He's <laughs> good. Um, all right, so maybe we'll, we'll start off with a fairly, maybe deceptively simple question, but the idea of creative enterprise and, and what that means, what does a term like that mean for each of you in your respective fields at the moment? Look, I, I mean, this might sound rather cynical, but I sort of see it as the commod commodification of my art form. And I don't think there should be any shame in trying to do that. I mm. think um, as, a, as an Australian artist, we don't usually associate money with um, our art. <laughs> <laughs> but I think America does that very well. They don't, they understand business. And, that, and that's, you know, that's what I think creative enterprise is. It's putting mm. creatives you know, into the business stream, and so you can make, essentially make a living from your art, <laughs> which is the goal, isn't it? What about you, Rob? Hmm. Um, well, it's funny, I was talking to a colleague today and saying I felt like a bit of a fake being on a creative panel because I don't feel creative because I sort of do the business side of film and TV, and as much as I like to think of myself as creative, a lot of my day is spent, you know, reading legal documents or doing Excel spreadsheets, but then what he said to me, which, uh, which was encouraging, maybe he was just saying it to make me feel better, but um, my role and, and what I love about my role is that the deals I do and the financing I put in place actually enables, you know, amazing people like Alison to make their and fund their endeavours. So in a small way, whilst I might not be, you know, writing the script or coming up with a concept, as you point out, it's crucial to, um, to have things funded and to get these things made mm -hmm. and to realise the vision of these really creative people. So it's fantastic to be able to, to, to sort of to do that and, and you know, um, occasionally sort of give an opinion that no one wants to hear about the script <laughs> or something like that. Well, it's appropriate. We need you. I mean, you are the enterprise, uh, you know, you, are, you, you speak for part enterprise. Yeah. 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 Right. So it's, in, right. it's a really important part of what we want to talk about, you know, um, so that's great. Mm. So, Sandra, you, you come with a different, you come with a couple of different perspectives on yeah, this Yeah, I do. I think, um, I mean, we talk about, you know, coming as a head of a film school, uh, you know, I, was, I always call myself, you know, practitioner, filmmaker, um, academic and always striving to know um, with the business side of everything. So I think for me, uh, entrepreneurship and creative artist, especially, you know, female filmmaker who clocked 50, um, you know, you kind of go, okay, you need to be entrepreneurial from, from get-go. Mm. So for me, becoming a head of a department, like a, a film school where we're still small enough to, um, I suppose, really influence you know, um, graduates going into the industry and making them really understand the importance of business and the importance of 
kind of listening and learning. And so, so for, for me tonight, it's definitely from a head of school point of view, um, uh, I think it's really, it's just vital now to see ourselves as a global um, school. Uh, VCA, you know, our faculty is fantastic. And the more we travel, the more we send graduates out there, the more awards they win, the more success our alumni are having, the more we think, oh, how, do we, how does the world not know of us? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And, you know, even just coming recently, last year going to the Cannes Film Festival, of course they know us. We've had so much alumni in, in, the, in the thing, it's ridiculous. So I just went, you know, we've we got we to gotta use that. We've got to use that to our advantage. And are we training these students well enough to step into that world? Um, I know, think we the, give, I, yeah, I do. The commercial part of that? I, yeah, process? I do. I think there's two headspaces for it. I think when you're at film school, you're at film school. And I think there's a level of learning that should not incorporate um, the business yet. Okay. But I think what you're doing is you're giving them the craft in order to walk out and uh, catch on very quickly to you know, to what they need to do in order to, you know, please people like Rob or, you know, or, or to, to engage in that conversation. Yeah. So without, you've got to spend a lot of years learning the craft yeah. and in order to do that, you need, a, you need a bit of freedom. But then come the tail end of it, you know, we've got graduates here tonight that, you know, um, one or two years out of film school, they're ready because mm. they listened, they, they were good students, you know, and, and ambitious, that's why they're here. Indeed. There's mm. certainly an exposure over here in a, in a way that I feel I, I, I haven't experienced at home. Uh, an exposure to concepts of market that, that, don't, that seem to elude us at home. Like I, I, I feel like as an artist, having had that bubbled experience and certainly spending a lot of my career on the stage, mm. very bubbled <laughs> experience as an artist, yeah. uh, and then stepping into the world of writing and creating and... and uh, finding a position as a businesswoman in in the marketplace as well i've had to i've had to study the market over here i've had very explicit conversations about what people are looking for and what they want and and doing something that hasn't been done before and it's all very explicit here mm. about finding your position in in the marketplace and i feel like i did have the luxury of that bubble experience but now i'm having this other quite confronting at times experience because you go, yeah, but it's a lovely idea. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. The market doesn't want that right now. So it's, I feel like it's um, being in this environment, mm -hmm. we get much more exposure to the realities of a marketplace and, and the economy of making art. And it's a big, it's a it, it's a bigger market, but it's also more competitive here. Is that right? Yeah. Is there that balance? Is that um, is that true? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, and I think there is sort of this myth that there's a lot more opportunity here. Mm. Um, and of course, th of course there is, but there's also a trillion people trying <laughs> to do what you're doing. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah. whereas at home, it's such a small pool. And I feel like, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I, I would have made the letdown if I was doing it here. You know, I feel mm. like I had such extraordinary support at home and there, and, and, uh, and they could see that this was a very niche way of looking at motherhood and, and a way that we, that hadn't happened before. Um, but, uh, you know, I've had people tell me over here that if you pitched that show in America mm. five years ago, no one would have bought it. Like, well, well, they did <laughs> in the end. Uh, so, yeah. shush. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's I think right. Tick to you. Yeah. 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 But I think because of the, uh, because of the contacts and the, and the, you know, the ABC, thank God for the ABC, mm. uh, I was able to make that show in Australia. And then... You know, the pilot at least, and then the and then Netflix saw the pilot and went, actually, this could be something that works internationally. So, you know, I, I yeah, I, I think sometimes smallness gives you opportunities yeah. that you're not going to find here, and here there is a different style of, a different manner, and many, the, the codes, I'm sure a lot of you um, Melbourneites would, uh, would agree, the codes here in business are very different to those at home. Uh, there's a lot more silence here. So a lot more talking and then a lot more silence. <laughs> uh, so, that, <laughs> so all those things are really hard to get used to. Um, but this, this illusion of opportunity for all over here is, yeah. is certainly an illusion. The letdown, you, you're making that because you want to make it. It's a, it's, yes. a, it's a piece of art in, in a sense at that moment. So you're not thinking commercially yet. Is no, that right? Yeah. Certainly was not. And that's, that seems to happen a lot for Australians who have come here and done well. They've, they've, made an, they've had some sort of organic process that's gone well. They've created something mm. that suddenly creates an interest commercially, yeah? Um, I mean, Rob, is the marketplace here, is it large or small? Is it impenetrable? 
what's your feel on that for a say for an Australian coming here? Because we'll go down that with that theme for obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously Australia has um, has provided the world with such amazing talent. So I think everyone Australia there's a very receptive audience. I think to Australian creative endeavours. But then, um, you know, to Alison's point, there the way that content is bought now, and when you're sitting in a meeting room at Netflix or Amazon or HBO or wherever it may be, it it all comes down to to business. And I think what's been um, what's been strange for a lot of people as the rise of the streamers and the SWOD players has come up, that you've had creative people pitching ideas to essentially kind of a room full of tech guys <laughs> um, yeah. who are not necessarily that creative. So I think it's, it's switched now in that a lot of creative executives have now been poached into those companies. So, um, you know, we lost a woman from NBC who went to head up Amazon Studios. So you've now got people who actually know about... Um, but for a while, there was this weird tension of you had the people making the decisions mm. were, you know, maybe people who'd previously been engineers at Google or something who were mm. kind of... Mm. Um, so I think we've... That's now sort of moved around, but I think um, what's really crucial in these things is is to have that mix of the business and the creative. And we were talking before about, for me, if I'm pitching a project, like to have the creator there in the room and, and get that mix right of pitching the passion for the idea, mm -hmm. getting them excited, but then I'm sort of there to guide and say, look, what they might be looking for is, you know, they've they had a show last year that failed that was this. So don't mention that word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, maybe play up this element and Perfect. here's some things that have worked for them. So, you know, maybe we can steer it and sort of paint it as this. And it sounds more deceptive than it is, but um, it's that mix because the last thing you want, and, and you do see it happen, is someone who has an amaz amazing vision, but then just the pitch goes wrong in the room and you lose them and you mm. know that, mm -hmm. that it could have gone differently. So I think to get that mix right in a competitive environment is, is really key. And Alison, you mentioned for the letdown, you weren't given that opportunity, were you? It was taken out of your hand. No, is that right? uh, and I, I don't think that's that uncommon yeah. when you're reaching out from Australia. Uh, so we created a pilot in Australia and it was aired on the ABC. And then as, as the ABC has to do for every project, they said, it's green lit if you can get a co-producer. So then um, <laughs> our producers were looking over here uh, to, obviously, um, <laughs> <laughs> try and get our show made. Um, they took the pilot to, uh, to Netflix. And Sarah was in on one meeting, my co-creator, uh, but she wasn't there at the final meeting where they actually said, yeah, we'll do it. Mm. But that was a, a couple of men <laughs> in the room. Uh, <laughs> and four men, I believe, <laughs> were in that room deciding they would make the show about the mothers. Uh, but thank you to them. because we got Well, to they did a good it. job. They did a good way, job. They it? sold it. Yeah. So, so yeah, something. it worked. Um, <laughs> it is funny, though, like sometimes, yeah. um, and, and I, I would always, so in that situation, you definitely should have been in the room, particularly because <laughs> I think just, you know, to sell it in the best way, but I'm glad it worked anyway. But sometimes I remember doing one pitch where the showrunner came along and we got to reception and he was sitting there with his eyes closed like this, and, and the people who were around him were like, don't disturb him, because he's just getting ready for the process. And I was like, but we need to talk before this meeting. But, and then that guy went in, and he did quite well, but it was sort of, it, was, it, it can sometimes be a little strange as well, depending on that mm. tension between business and creative. Absolutely. And I think for him, he, he needed, you know, 20 minutes of meditation before the meeting. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's often a weird, a weird process. And I'm sure many of you have pitched uh, over here, but the processes are so, for those of you who haven't, the processes are so different to home. <laughs> At home, it's like a chat on the phone, <laughs> or at least it was, uh, you yeah. know. But I mean, we had to obviously for the letdown, we had to do, jump through a number of hoops. But um, but subsequently, I, I just have conversations with people at home. And whereas here, you know, Sarah and I, we were developing a show with FX at the moment, and so we went out and did that big pitching circuit, and we had a we had a twenty minute script that we recited the same jokes every time, you know. Like, yes. uh, but uh, you had to walk in and perform, and the expectation was that you would start reading the script. I'm sorry mm. if I'm telling you things you already know, but it was a, it's a very peculiar thing. And for yeah. Sarah, for me, I was a nervous wreck, but I'm an actor. For Sarah, she was like, you're an actor, it's okay for you. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's, it's not, it's yeah. also weird for me. But they mm. would, you know, a lot of people we met would just say, okay, go. <laughs> okay, you know, and you'd perform. Yeah. So it's a really different thing. Yeah. I really Reasons. feel for writers who don't have a performance background to walk into that environment that's highly competitive, highly stressful, yeah. and you're meant to dance like a performer. And, and make those jokes seem fresh like, yes. by the fourth <laughs> meeting or something. That's yeah. Right. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> Which is a challenge even for an actor. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a peculiar, peculiar, very different, obviously, to home, but I can see why we need business people in there to talk business. <laughs> yeah. Help us out. Well, yeah. and I think, yeah, and, and often it's the mix, I think, just to, um, you need someone who's a business person who's sympathetic to the creative person process and then a creative person who realises that it's important not to say those things because it is it's a bit of a game and it's not yeah. normal yes. it's a very tense sort of forced environment so to get the best result it can be and sometimes it just goes wrong you know sometimes mm. for no reason maybe the person who you're pitching to is just not a very nice person or mm. you know so it's it's it, there's always that luck of the draw but but definitely um yeah having the person who has that vision and that passion i think that you can never go wrong if you get them to convey that in some way, mm. I think. But I think what's it's great, just, I've only met Sandra tonight, but you're so good at connecting those two things of business and creative. I think it's really great. I mean, I feel like you're gonna sort it out because <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're so passionate about it, which is great yeah. for, I think, yeah. and for your alumni. I think that's a great, yeah. it's really essential, as you said. I think I, I, and I did, and you know, I'm not taking credit for being you know, fab or anything like that. It's not that at all. <laughs> do it, go it's on, just do it. I'm really not, actually, it just comes out like that. But <laughs> it is literally just really understanding the, and I think when I wanted it so much when I was a kid, yep. you know, who doesn't want to be a director? You know, um, once I worked out Jane Camping could do it, surely I could do it. <laughs> and so those dreams are still very much alive for me. So mm. I, I, I know that, you know, passion has a lot to do with it. Talent, craft, where you work hard, you're going to get there eventually. And if you don't, that's fine. Just do something that you're passionate about. Um, so I think all those things are very, I think, also embedded in, you know, my upbringing and, and, and how I work at the university. But I think being, also being, a, not, not, also not mentored, but... You know, I'm in a place where the skills that I didn't have as a filmmaker, and I, you know, I studied at my film school, um, and I don't know if I was a naturally, a, a, you know, clever when it came to working things out, but I knew that um, getting a job as an academic was a was ridiculous because I failed English, <laughs> so you know, it was like, okay, I, okay, how am I going to navigate this one? And I got a master's degree, so I think putting myself in an environment where I had to I had to learn a lot really quickly over like, you know, a few years and being mm -hmm. at a university setting, I got to learn how to communicate a bit better and tell less jokes and not be nervous and, you know, I, f I did three years of drama as well before film school. Mm -hmm. So all those elements came into place. But I do think you need to have a positive attitude or just, yep. I don't know what you're doing in this industry if you're not happy to be here. And, um, and I do think you need to be very clever. And if you're not, find somebody else who, who is. You, you can't know it all. Um, and, and you're an amazing example. You've got a senior role in a, in a major institu teaching institution, but you and you've had award-winning film speeches. But you still rock up regularly with new projects and try and build the support from the ground up, don't you? And you go to whichever marketplace you can. Is that true? Yeah. 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 And I yeah I find you know I've, I've found enough money to make my last two features you know from private investors and mm. um, but only because that's just I've had to teach myself how to do visual effects. You know, I come from drama, like, you know, a lot of other people in this room, you come from one particular thing. So it was almost like, well, who's going to teach me visual effects? Like, who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna teach me that, you know? Mm -hmm. I, uh, so I had to go and I raised money and I made a, a little film called The Green Door and I, I taught myself a lot. And then I went, okay, well, somebody's going to give me more money for a monster movie and... <laughs> so now I, le I learnt stunts and, and I learnt a whole bunch of other skills that, um, you know... So, yeah, you, you have to seek out what you can and can't do and I, I, I don't want to just be here, you know, I want to be able to make $80 million movies if I want. Absolutely. And, um, you know, but you've got to know what you're talking about so you've got to put yourself there. There's a lot of talking. Move on now, Pete. <laughs> so, can I ask you about it? I, you're, you're both from Melbourne. You've ended up here and Sandra's mm. to and fro. Do you have a sense of identity? I'm wondering about that professionally. How do you identify your, yourself? So how do you do that professionally? Like, what are you? Are you a nationality? Are you part of a culture, part of an art form profession? You know, how do you do that when, you're, when you've come and set up here as you have? And I feel like uh, because of the nature of the, the project that has brought me over here, uh, it being very uh, female focused, that I, I consider myself part of that conversation um, in the world. Part of, you know, like Sarah and I 
we're very conscious of the gap back at home. Um, our, our foray into writing was very much, uh, very much born of a, a, a desperate need to be part of the solution, okay. rather, uh, you know, to change the way we were depicting women on screen and, mm. and to, rather than me at home getting scripts and being disappointed or, you know, for television scripts, whatever, um, to actually stop whinging and do it. So, I f and I feel like we did it at a time when the writing was on the wall and that was just, that was just luck, you know, mm. and a lot of this is just luck. I know there's all the learning and all the things, but then there's a whole lot of luck. So the timing was right, and so I do, I do feel like there was this movement around the world where this was, I mean, everyone's, female artists have been trying to do this forever, mm -hmm. but there, all of a sudden there was a receptivity to it. Um, and we just caught that wave. So I do feel like when I'm over here, I am speaking, I'm, I'm part of a much bigger conversation than, than just being an Australian artist. Mm -hmm. Not that mm. there's anything wrong with being an Australian artist. I'm also very proud to identify myself in rooms as an Australian artist, except when I'm auditioning and then I'm supposed to stay in accent, <laughs> which is very confronting. But anyway, <laughs> when I'm talking as a creator or a writer, you know, I'm very much, I very much lean on my Australianness because I think, um, you know, we, I, we, we are well received here. There's currency um, in that, in a way. Yeah, yeah. there is currency in that. Mm. Um, but yes, I also, I think, you know, Sandra's talking about a certain agility that's required uh, in, our, in any of the art forms, and I do now, I no longer limit myself to one hat. You know, at the last series of The Letdown, I, I produced, wrote, uh, acted in, I uh, directed. Um, yeah. I'm a megalomaniac, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. no, that's out of kind of necessity, and uh, and I have a great passion for the work, and there we, as you all know, we have very limited resources at home, so I'm very happy to do whatever I need to do for a project, but it means that I now identify myself in a myriad of ways, mm. and and I continue to do that here because I'm learning, you know, this is what happens here. There's no kind of you sell a show and people are like, yeah, and you're like, yes, but it's still like this. Oh. <laughs> What's your occupation so. when you come into an airport? <laughs> I now say writer. Okay. You get lots oh. of questions. That's a challenge. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, if you're an actor, they always ask you what you're in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you don't say a big movie, they're very disappointed. I know so. that feeling. <laughs> I know I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> so writer's safe. Uh, yes, but I, yep. my answer, the short answer is I identify in very many ways. It's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, how about you? Um, it's, it's strange because I actually haven't lived in Australia since the late 90s. Mm -hmm. So I left in 99, mid 99, to move to London and spent almost 20 years there before moving here. Indeed. Um, but it's funny, I think just recently, maybe a year ago, um, Kim, who's in the audience, I, I went to a Melbourne Uni alumni event. Um, and met Kim, who we realised we were in the same course, same year, didn't know each other, had new people in common, so that was great. It only took us 30-something years to get to know each other. Uh, and then meeting Peter from sort of Australian in film. I feel like having been away for 21 years, I, I feel the most Australian at the moment, which is kind of nice because wow. it's connecting. Um, so I've never really, I think in a weird way, moving to London, I was trying to get away from being Australian for a bit. Not because I was ashamed of it, but I just wanted to be European or <laughs> wanted to be a Londoner. And so, and I always scoffed at people who went to, you know, Aussie themed pubs and that sort of thing. Um, but I think I've come around <laughs> to it now and it's, it's lovely. They're really cool. Yeah. <laughs> they are. They are cool. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, um, yeah, and it's great to be in the entertainment industry, I think, and be Australian just because mm. there are so many fantastic people that, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a badge of honour in mm. a way. Um, so, yeah, I'm a newly reborn... Uh, <laughs> Welcome back. Aussie. Welcome back to us. <laughs> Boy from good, Ballarat. Good to back. have you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Sandra? Like, you have a few hats on as well. What was the question again, though? Well, how do you... What, what's your... I kind of went everywhere and I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> that was what my you, fault, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you, what's your occupation? What do you write on your occupation when you go into an airport? <laughs> uh, okay, well... Uh, I write academic, film, film academic. I have yeah. to put film in there. Um, now I put head of school dash filmmaker. Hmm. I don't mind that one. <laughs> uh, it's kind of good. It's you know, it sounds right. It sounds nice. It's good. And I also like having the filmmaker first and dash and the head of school because I feel like that will influence what I do as an educator. And then hopefully when I leave, th those things are already. 
kind of embedded, embedded into what I do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting yeah. to ask that because you, this is a you, the, this, this whole audience has taken up the challenge to to be somewhere else from where you once were mm. or from where you were predominantly educated. That's a great risk in life, and and what flows from that, and how does it affect how you see yourself and and your professional self? And I think that's worth uh, exploring. You know, it's mm. interesting. Um, what about the future? Do you think um, you know, it's, a, it's a difficult time? There seems to be a, a crises flowing at the moment in Australia and, and, and the world. There's climate, there's, there's, there's health and politics, there's challenges around. Is it a good time to be coming out of a university with creative aspirations and, and wanting to go to the world? Is this, is, this opt is this an optimistic thing, do you think? It certainly uh. feels like a time where um, there's more opportunity for a more diverse range of people. So I think in that way, yeah. it's because there is actively people trying to make sure that's the case. Yeah. And I think whether it's entertainment or any industry, in the past that wasn't necessarily the case. So there was a whole lot of people that felt blocked out of that or mm. not able to be part of it. So I think yeah. that must be really exciting. Like if you're, I, hopefully, the way people are starting to feel graduating from film school is whatever their background or their um, you know, their ethnicity or their gender or whatever it might be, that there is hopefully no feeling of like, well, that's not going to be for me because, you know, so, and it's, it's obviously still not there, but I think that must be amazing because I'm sure there must have been so many, I mean, not to get too sort of sad about it, but so many dashed hopes in the past of people just like, well, I'm never going to make it in that club because yeah. I don't sort of fit. And, and so I think it must be really exciting in a way. Mm. Well, I hope so. That's, that's yeah. true for the school, isn't it? There's a, a seriously oh, conscious push to find absolutely. diversity, to encourage diversity, yep. yeah? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a graduate of my own film school and it was, but, you know, funny enough, I'm looking in the back row and there's a whole bunch of, like, very cool kind of ethnic... <laughs> I'm um, graduates, and um, you know we know it was it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy being the only one of two Europeans when I went to film school. It was mm. it wasn't easy, and uh, and I came back to teach, and it was a school that you can kind of tell as a VCA that it was going to change, but it was really slow. So it was kind of like where are where's the change? I thought this I thought this place would be different by now, and it, and it, and it wasn't. Mm. Um, so we know that there was a gap. In who, was t in, in who was coming into the film school still. So it was a pretty, you know, uh, frustrating for, for me, mm. um, like, like some of the other staff. But it just, we just made it an agenda. We made it an agenda to, um, you know, make sure we were involved in the way, you know, young women were being educated, you know, making sure that, you know, they weren't afraid to pick up a camera in a room. We, 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 we thought of strategies. The previous head of school, Nicolette Freeman, was a, was a, is a cinematographer. So we just really focused on what we could do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we went out into the community. And we, we just, you know, we made Indigenous students a kind of focus for us as well. And um, and bro just broke down the barriers that we could, but it's a slow, it's still a slow process because there's still issues that we need to solve if we're going to have students from all over the the country, from you know some pretty tough worlds, yep. coming into an establishment that is so truly University of Melbourne <laughs> at many levels. Mm. That is not easy, and it's not easy to help those graduates. I feel like that's probably that's that unique voice that you go, we want to, but yeah. we can't really. How well can we look after that? And what do we do when we finish? We just send somebody off to the middle of Darwin and good right. luck with that one. You know, I mean, it doesn't... Mm. We need to do more. I feel yeah. like that's maybe the one area that's a little underserved in that there's been a lot of focus on certain things, but socioeconomic barriers are maybe one of the ones because it's, it's hard to encapsulate and it doesn't necessarily... Yeah, it's, that, I think, is still a barrier in lots of areas in life and I think in... Filmmaking, it's and that's where grants and support and everything really help. But that's that's one that I think is probably the next one that really needs more. Yeah. Focus. Is this where I hold this up and do that? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that is something we're going to try to address in yeah, this. Absolutely, it's been you know. a real it's been a real thing. And you know, yeah. you can you can we can say entrepreneurial as much as we want, but the rich is the rich, and the working class is the working class, and there's a hell of a gap in between. So and so, you know. There are things that we do, there are things that we can genuinely do that will make a difference mm -hmm. yeah. if you open your eyes to it. And I think, uh, you know, we've got another staff member here, Ben Michaels, you know, we talk about class all the time. It's our thing, isn't it? You know, it's his obsession, <laughs> it's my obsession. How do, what do we, that's it. So what do we do about that in, a, in an establishment that is University of Melbourne? 
You know, it's a great yeah. university. We're so proud to be here. It's the greatest thing on my wall every time my mother reminds me <laughs> of the <laughs> University of Melbourne thing. You know. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we make that work for all? And um, that's, I mean, I think that's when Peter and I hooked up and we said, well, you know, I want some money. I want some real money. Yep. I know it's out there. People got money. I don't have it, but somebody's got it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, yep. let's put, it, put it where, you know, I'm looking at beautiful Nadia Tats, who's an incredible filmmaker, uh, in and out of Australia all the time, still comes to our film school. Mm. Uh, how many films have you made, Nadia? <laughs> you know, so many. 17 <laughs> movies, you know, yeah. and here she is tonight supporting us. So yep. it's... You know, we, we, we need that voice. We need, uh, we need cash. It's so exciting mm. that But I'm not is pitching to put money <laughs> in, I'm just no. saying. No, but it's a, good, it's a good thing it's just to pitch because I think this is something America does extremely well and oh, we don't do have a strong well. tradition at home and it's a, it's a real yeah. problem and we need to speak more openly and honestly about the situation of artists at home. You know, I, 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 I am shameless in saying that I came over here in an attempt to make my art sustainable. I can't survive at home mm. on the money, even though I'm making that show. Yeah. It's just not a sustainable way of living because of the finite resources, because of the limited yeah. amount of, just because of money, because of how much money you get and how long that lasts when you're in a gap. And you know, that's, I mean, I'm sure that's why a lot of people are here from our industry. So I think we need to be really open and honest about that, about yeah. being on the verge of going broke, even if you're um, a success at mm. home, at, yeah. at all times. <laughs> you know? um, that's the reality. And we need philanthropists and we need, you that's know... That's what being entrepreneurial is, isn't it? Go out and seek money. Yeah. Other people do it really well. So yeah. I think it's what you do with money that matters. And, yeah. uh, and I think, yeah, there's just some ways that, yeah, we should... Artists need to just learn how to do it. Or maybe it's just, I don't know, filmmakers. Maybe everyone else it's does it really well. It's all the arts, well. though. No. All of us. Are oh, well, then we've all got issues. We should just, we all, uh, well, we should just <laughs> hang out together We more need more robs. And have, have, <laughs> more, have more get-togethers. <laughs> the business also, deals. Your, your art is a very, very expensive one. Yes. So we are expensive. Uh, it's, it's one it's, of the big, you, biggest problems that we have. There's a great challenge have. there. Yeah. yeah. Should we throw to some questions if anyone Absolutely. has any at this point for a little bit, little bit before we wrap up? Yeah, beautiful. Nice and loud. Yeah, you oh. and I were the only Europeans, yeah. And it is definitely a different climate, and, and we're getting there. And you know, yeah. the more people, people like Robin that talk about it, and we make it an issue. It's how we create a really healthy, diverse, well, you know. And let's not throw that word around so much. Like it, we have to actually make it matter. Um, so being very proactive in how and what projects we pick up, what work we do, how we develop the projects, how we do development, you know. Um, but yeah. If it's any consolation, uh, over at the drama school, where I was, I was told the same thing. We were all told that. We were all, in third year, one of the last days, you know, they kind of said, one of you might have a career. <laughs> and I was like, that's good. Well, it has to be me then, because <laughs> I want to do that, you know. But, you know, it, it's demoralising to hear that. But I think that... It's not true, though, it's many of us that Yes, no, and it, yes. Mm. I'm pretty sure it's a multi-million dollar industry for somebody. Mm. It, and, it's you know, it some, it's, I'm pretty sure we're in the for right our, place for our for government. It. it is a multi-million dollar yeah, industry. Yeah, it is. They like to give it away um, a lot, though. They'd like to pretend we, did, we are not of any value, but that's absolutely true. We are a big earner for the government. We're a big earner. Mm. Don't we make a lot of money? Don't you make a lot of money? I mean, like not you, but the companies. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that's. I mean, it's pretty very personal. Put him on the spot. <laughs> he knows what I mean. I deserve more. No, there's <laughs> a. There's a, a um, I mean, there's a reason there's a massive industry. I mean, I work oh. for a big, you know, global studio. There's a reason there's a big business around it because it, obviously it makes money, and mm. that's yep. why you know that's why Netflix is worth so much money, and and it it's definitely it's just making sure some of that gets down to the right people and. Mm. I, I mean, it seems to kind of, um, the good news is that it seems to sort of work out. I mean, not everyone makes it, but great stuff is still getting made. I think there was a fear at one point that with streaming and with the internet and smartphones that suddenly no one was going to invest in high quality drama. It was all going to be like, you know, little like web um, 
web series and it was all going to be people just, you know, that there wasn't going to be this diverse range of content. And it's even better it's in some ways yeah. just because yeah. there's so many more platforms. I mean, it's yeah. still a struggle for, I think, people on the coming up and that's what needs to be worked out. But the good news is that, I mean, we have amazing, I mean, it's an overused term about kind of peak television and that sort of stuff, but mm. really there's fantastic stuff and films getting made that are amazing. Do you have an opinion on local content? So in Australia, there's a conversation around, around regulation and, hmm. you know, free to air have restrictions, streaming at the moment doesn't. Yep. Do you have a view on that? Like, should there, should there be some um, movement there? I don't know, I'm probably the wrong person to ask on, yeah. but, but I was having a conversation with a French colleague the other day, and France is obviously at the, at the height of like local quotas and, mm. and enforcing that, and, um, and there, it was in the context of a particular thing that was kind of annoying because it was a, a and it was, and, but then we said, well, the reason that regulation is there is to support the French film industry, and I was thinking, I love French film, mm. <laughs> and I'm really glad that so many French films get made, and interestingly, the French colleague was, was almost talking against it. I was saying, oh, actually, now I see the reason and I'm totally cool with that because I love French cinema. And she said, yeah, but there's a lot of bad French cinema that gets made as well. So it's almost, it's too much because <laughs> there's so much need to make that, that other things can't sort of come in. So you've got to get it right. You've got to have regulation that helps and you, you certainly don't want you know, American content to dominate the world. You want local content to yeah. also come up. But you can't have an, I think, be over-regulated so that it stifles mm. true kind of, you know, variation. So it's a, it's a tough one, but, you know, I'm not the, the expert on what's the right level. Mm. But I think mm. supporting in any walk of life or any type of, um, any part of life, I think supporting local industry is got to be a good industry. thing, right? It can't be yeah. a bad thing. No, it's got to be good. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think if, it's, if it doesn't, then we don't grow our artists. That's, that's going to be the outcome, that if, if we don't... We don't, if we don't enforce, uh, the, you know, the, if the big streamers, if we don't force them to, to make some local content, um, then it's, it's going to dry up at home. Yeah. And the market, yes, it's huge. And the good news is that now that, the, now that America is open to accents from around the world and other, you know, other cultures on, their, on the screen, that we can sell our, our content here. But there's still so many people trying to do the same thing. The bad news is this, it's still highly competitive. Yep. Um, and if, if we just rely on Netflix, if we just rely on Amazon and Apple, then, and, and our local networks, I just, I just saw a headline from an article saying they're not gonna survive. It's like, mm. <gasps> you know, if, if they don't, then, and there are no mm -hmm. um, local quotas and no local, you know, policy for local content making, then, then we're in a lot of trouble, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Is there one more question, or, or um, does anyone have anything to, to contribute? All right, that's, that's great. Can we thank our panellists, Rob, Sandra, and Alison? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sit back here. Thank you. Thank you. And then we're going to, I've got one more little business, and then we'll release you, I promise. Um, so thank you to our panel. Um, so I spoke a little bit earlier about the alumni network and we've heard from our students and alumni all over the world about how valuable that is and the power of the network actually rests with you, our community here. So my suggestion on behalf of my, my colleague and our team at the university is if you have another Melbourne graduate reach out to you on LinkedIn, uh, accept the request. If someone sends you an email or gives you a call and says that they're a Melbourne alum and they would like to talk to you about an idea, please read the email or take the meeting. Madeline, I know you've been doing that lately. Thank you. <laughs> so you're taking phone calls and, uh, and, and that's what we'd, we love to hear that. Um, you don't have to try and promise to get them a job or give them the project that they need, but just reach out and give them a bit of a time. Um, that's going to be greatly appreciated. Um, so Ask Alumni is one of those vehicles and you've probably heard about that. And it's, it's an exclusive University of Melbourne mentoring program that allows current students from all disciplines to connect with alumni and have a conversation about their plan for life after study. The beauty of the program, it only takes a 30 minute conversation with a student. It can be done by phone, video, email, or face to face if that suits. So please keep that in mind and there's some information out there on the table for you. Um, that's it, thank you for um, putting up with me for as long as you had to. And thank you for our, to our great panel. Please come and have a drink for us and with us and let's network together. Yeah.